the reasonably priced gaming PC is dead. Sentenced by the comments section, slain by the hand of the one who created it, sacrificed for the good of its own successor. Behold! Twenty twenty one was well, it was rough. Starting a new channel, I saw the landscape of the PC enthusiast community leaning towards the post-apocalyptic and decided my test platform for the year should reflect the economy of the time. While many of you, or at least those who respond to polls, seem to appreciate this less scientific approach to graphics card testing, other people who arrived on my higher-end card reviews saw lower numbers than they expected. The problem was, I thought I was making videos for people buying used GPUs because they had a low overall system budget. What I didn't expect, back when I started the channel, was that people would be looking to put used GPUs into otherwise brand new mid-range to high-end systems. Of course, thanks to the scalper pandemic, this is exactly where many people find themselves. In response, I've decided to furnish this year's Scalper Pandemic benchmark videos with a new test platform. The Ryzen 3 3100 of the RPG PC is being retired in favour of the Ryzen 5 5600G. This 6-core CPU with integrated Radeon graphics has featured heavily in budget build recommendations by other channels. If gamers have been building PCs off the back of these recommendations, I expect some of them will want to know how much extra performance they can get from replacing the integrated GPU with a second-hand graphics card. Hence, although it's far from competitive with other processors on the market right now, I think the 5600G is going to continue to be pretty relevant this year. To help keep things cool for some of the more stressful tests, the stock CPU cooler is being tossed in favour of a Vitru V5, an air cooler that's been hyped up by Jay's Two Cents and Hardware Canucks for its price to performance, and may well be the subject of its own video in the future. The motherboard, previously a pretty low-end B450, is being slightly upgraded to an MSI B450 Tomahawk Max version 2, and I'm keeping hold of the existing EVJ 600 w 80 plus white PSU until I find a good enough upgrade. The RAM remains the same, a pair of 8GB sticks of V-Color Prism Pro DDR4 4000, which after some testing I'm going to be using at a clock speed of 3600 with Titan timings. The storage is being upgraded to a 256GB Lighton NVMe SSD and a 2TB 3.5-inch hard drive. The case is a cheap yet preem ATX model from Antec with a set of Vitru 120mm fans, which I'm reusing from my all-white build from last summer. Affiliate links to everything are down below in case you're interested. This, you might point out, is not a reasonably priced PC. Far from it, in fact. The total cost for all of this is somewhere in the region of double that of the original RPG PC. What gives, you ask? Has Comrade Iceberg forgotten his populist roots? Well, yes and no. For those who enjoy the benchmarking videos I make right now, I'm not changing that much. I'll be running a new batch of games released in the last few months, as well as a couple of holdovers from last year, and I'll be running significantly more tests than before. Firstly, as this new PC isn't as reasonably priced, I'll be making some adjustments in the BIOS to get this PC running at about the same performance as the old one. I'll be disabling two of the 5600G6 cores and dropping clock speeds to 3.7GHz in order to perform at about the same level as the Ryzen 3 3100. This won't be a perfect analogue of course, the 5600G has better IPC and a larger cache, but it should be close enough to reflect the kind of experience owners of Ryzen 3100s, 3300Xs, i3-10100s, i7-7700s and so on can expect with the same GPUs in their system. The RAM will be run at a reduced clock speed of 3000 mega transfers a second, the same as I used for the bulk of last year. The result of this is a CPU that scores 6217 in Cinebench R23 and 4825 in Time Spy's physics test, which lines up pretty nicely with what I saw last year. For my second set of tests, however, the safeties are coming off. With all six cores enabled and overclocked to 4.6 GHz at 1.365 volts, and the DDR4 RAM running at 3600 mega transfers and latencies of 16, 20, 20, 38, I'll be in a better position to test higher performing graphics cards. 
though old Kepler and GCN cards aren't in much danger of being bottlenecked by a modern quad-core, even higher-end Maxwells and later GCNs can still find themselves being held back in some games. In this configuration, the Cinebench R23 scores jump to 11,577 and the Time Spy CPU score goes up to 8622, around what owners of the i5-10400 and i5-11400 should be expecting from their own CPUs. Hopefully this split approach will give the majority of gamers a solid idea of how their used GPUs will perform on a wide range of PC types. On the downside, I'm under no illusions, this isn't a zero compromise, bottleneck free environment. The 5600G is a fine CPU and the overclock will help a bunch, but it isn't even the fastest Ryzen for gaming in 2022, let alone the fastest processor. Plus, the choice of CPU and motherboard mean I'm limited to PCI Express Gen 3. If AMD's new RX 6500 XT is anything to go by, future budget GPUs could be bandwidth limited on this PC, and if that becomes an issue for testing, I'll have to deal with it at the time. As this is for the Versus 2022 series, of course I've gotten my hands on a suitably up-to-date set of games for benchmarking. These include... Unless you're new to the channel, it shouldn't be a surprise to see this one here. I covered Forza Horizon 4 for the whole of 2021, partly because it's on Game Pass, and partly because I became a little bit addicted to it. Sure enough, it wasn't a fluke, and Forza Horizon 5, which is awesome, will make its way onto the MPG PC in 2022. I might have mentioned my appreciation of the Master Chief Collection in my personal rig video, so of course Halo Infinite's going to be on the list. I'll be testing in the campaign open world section for a worst case benchmarking scenario, and also in some of the larger scale multiplayer matches. It made sense to me that I replace Horizon Zero Dawn with Sony's latest middle finger to console fanboys, God of War. Perhaps now I can finally play Horizon all the way through, instead of the same section over and over. I haven't paid money to Activision for a COD game in years, and makes me feel a bit dirty doing so here, but I have to think of my audience. If you thought I sucked at Warzone, just wait till you see how bad I am at something with actual pace. I wasn't sure how popular Battlefield 2042 would be as a benchmarking title, as it had a rough reception on release. That being said, a game with performance issues is one people are going to want to see tested, so it seemed like a logical choice. The Final Fantasy VII Remake is here mainly because I wanted to play it, really. I understand it doesn't have much in the way of settings to adjust, so either the game will run on a given card or it won't. Perhaps not the most exciting of benchmarks to watch, but we'll just have to wait and see. It didn't get a great response in my poll, but I have a feeling that Guardians of the Galaxy is going to find an audience, especially as people realise it isn't just Marvel's Avengers with a different skin. Plus, again, I just wanted to play it. I've chosen to test Rainbow Six Sex Traction for a few reasons. One, it's included in my Game Pass subscription, so it just makes sense. Two, other games in the Rainbow series have been pretty popular, so I'm gambling that this one will be too. Three, I was considering Back for Blood, but that game didn't get good feedback from the community. And four, I just like saying the title. Rainbow Sick Sex Traction. Also, for the sake of my channel's discoverability, a few old favourites are returning from 2021. Little-known indie sleeper hit Fortnite sort of grew on me last year, so I decided I should bring it back again in the hopes I can spotlight it, maybe get a few more players interested. I know performance mode is the popular choice these days, but I'll be sticking to the higher quality renderer where appropriate. Call of Duty Warzone is a roller coaster for benchmarkers. Since I last tested the game, the Eastern European urban sprawl has been replaced with a Pacific jungle, and who knows how they've managed to screw up the game in the process, so I consider it my duty to report on how it's doing. We have CDPR's solemn promise that Cyberpunk will receive updates in 2022, so I don't think it's completely past its relevance yet. Whether performance is a priority for them over new content and bug fixes or not, I'll be testing 2077 out in 2022. 
I like to have at least one fairly low-spec friendly title on the benchmarking suite, and as it turned out Valorant is so CPU limited that everything from the R9 270X upwards scored about the same, I decided to go with Splitgate this year. Arguably this title is covering similar ground to Halo Infinite, but it also makes a good alternative to that game for people whose cards can't handle the chief. So, what's next for the MPG PC? Well, the first graphics card queued up for testing is the legendary NVIDIA GTX 970. Though, if you've watched my Nimei's driver video, you should have a good idea of at least three more GPUs I have on hand for testing. Plus, of course, it'll be a shame to have that integrated GPU on hand and not do anything with it. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.